Hello again everyone and welcome back to the underground. Today I thought we'd do something a little bit different and come to the desktop here and talk a little bit about something that doesn't really get talked about a whole lot in the uh, outdoor community and that is map cases. So let's go over some of the options that are out there for protecting your maps and kind of setting up your navigation kit, right? So the first kind of map case that people are familiar with are kind of the, the sort of more flexible plastic options, uh, just like this one right here. This is very just uh, very simple. Uh, it's made out of some kind of um, flexible plastic, and the idea here is you, you, you thread your map in there and you're good to go, right? Um, these uh, have worked for a lot of people over the years. Uh, for me, I absolutely detest these. And it's really for two reasons. Uh, for one, if I leave a map um, in here for any period of time, I find that this kind, this style of, of flexible plastic is really uh, bad for picking up the ink from a map. So it's not so much an issue if you buy pre-printed maps, but I myself tend to make most of the maps that I use. I just make them in uh, QGIS or ArcGIS, and uh, I print them out on a normal home inkjet printer, and that's what I use. And I have found that if you leave this out in the sun or in the heat in any kind of way, uh, the ink will tend to transfer onto the plastic, and you're just going to have a heck of a time cleaning it out. So it's, it's these kinds of things. I've I've used these for years. Many people still use them. They're perfectly fine. Uh, you'll find a lot of commercial solutions out on the market have something like this, or something a little bit um, more uh, more substantial to it, right? That it will fold out a lot larger, but. I just tend to not like these for that reason, and the other reason that I tend to not like these that are more flexible plastic is due to Murphy's Law of Combat Navigation, and that is that if you get shot at, it will absolutely be at the very edge of the map. <laughs> That's exactly what's going to happen. Uh, if you need to call in a grid somewhere, or if you're trying to... Um, if, if you're in kind of a tense situation and you need to find out where you are, it will always be right at the very edge of the map. And then what you've got to do is you've got to open it up, pull it out, refold it, and then kind of somehow jam it back in there. And then you have a clear view of where you're at and where the bad guys might be. So I've found that to be exceedingly frustrating over the years, and I've just kind of had enough with, with dealing with that. So for some people, again, it's not that big of a deal. And... Um, I know the good practices with Land Nevis to always make sure that your position is centered in the map case that you have, but let's face it, we're not going to do that. We're not going to halt every, you know, kilometer or so and uh, refold our map. It's just not going to happen. So you, you tend to either walk off the edge of the map or uh, something bad tends to happen right when you get to the crease or the edge. So. Uh, and, and this style of map case makes it harder to deal with that kind of situation. So I don't really like using these so much. Uh, the other style is kind of what some of the more admin nerds like like me uh, tend to do, which is have some kind of notebook case. Uh, this is just a normal 5x7 uh, standard binder holder thing uh, that might have a, uh, a map case kind of built into it. But again, you know, this is not a particularly bad idea. This is a great idea for things like checklists and stuff like that, but... Uh, if I'm going to be using this for maps, again, it's the same problem. You've still got to thread it out, and it's frustrating, and it kind of creases, and the sun damages it a lot of times. Uh, so I really tend to not like these more plasticized uh, things like this. So, of course, uh, in recent years, uh, there has been a company that has addressed this problem, at least for um, vehicle-based setups, and that is a company called Battleboard, and trust me, I have spent several hundred dollars uh, buying all different kinds of their sort of product line, right? So uh, this is, I think, one of the very first generations of, of Battleboard, right? But uh, this is kind of exactly what I'm looking for, right? It so this kind of thing is almost exactly what I'm looking for, right? It's uh, got a nice solid Lexan uh, plastic hard cover, right? So you can write on it. Uh, it. It's very useful in many other ways. You can look up product reviews on the Battleboard system and see uh, just how awesome it is. And a lot of uh, a lot of different services and agencies and people use these. Um, and I, I've used these for a long time as well. But as you can see, there's kind of a problem with it, and that is its size. It's just too dang big. Now they do make uh, smaller versions of of these uh, these uh, battle boards that are kind of like five and a half or eight and a half by eleven, so a standard sheet of paper size. 
Uh, I don't. I haven't bought those. I just went ahead and bought kind of one of the first sizes they came out with. Uh, but you can clearly see that this is a great idea. It's just the problem is it's just it's too big for you know walking around in the woods. You're not exactly going to carry this <laughs> as you're on your hike, right? For a vehicle, yeah, it might uh, it might work uh, for a, a standard like talk setup. If you're going to set up like a talk in the middle of the woods or something like that, or like a little base camp, uh, this will this will work great, and you can hang it up and have a nice little briefing board. But for the most part. This idea is something that I wanted to go with and, and kind of create my own solution. And that solution is sort of along the same lines, but it's just smaller, right? So these are two that I made uh, myself. This one, uh, you can obviously tell that I made them myself because they're not uh, stitched very well. This is the first one I made kind of on a lazy Sunday afternoon, and it's kind of the same idea as the battleboard setup. It's just smaller and a little bit lighter. And uh, I, you know, I wanted to put in places for pens and map, uh, map markers and things like that, and places to put your protractors, and even if you wanted to put a compass in there and kind of leave that in there, that's kind of what I, uh, kind of what I liked, right? And you know, some might say this is still a little bit too big, uh, but this is seven inches by ten inches, and that's kind of like my perfect, perfect size for fitting inside like a British style smock or inside a, uh, a large GP pouch. It just slides right in there if you're wearing like some kind of chest rig or something like that. Uh, I think that works really, really well. So uh, I made this this first one here is kind of like a low effort sample. I made this one to kind of fit inside a standard uh, British Army smock and it works just fine. Uh, same with this one as well. I kind of copied the same dimensions just because I liked it so much. Um, you know, I have a, a few different little custom things as well. Uh, again, I've got the same kind of general construction spot for your for your compass, spot for a little map light, and of course a sleeve for your uh, protractors and things like that. So, again, the reason that I like this kind of style so much is that it just takes a couple of a couple of snaps, and now you're now you're on a different map. And if you've got if you're not using like a commercial map like this one is, uh, you can print off many 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 layers. You can probably get 30 to 40 different maps inside this thing. Just kind of stack them together, and you don't ever have to worry about walking off the edge of your map, which is something that you know everybody's uh, constantly had problems with over the years, right? So yeah, that's pretty much the solution I've kind of come up with. Uh, it's not particularly innovative, right? But uh, it does uh, seem to work quite well. Uh, and if you make your own, you can do kind of some custom work, like putting a VS-17 panel on the inside, you know, just in case. Uh, it's never a bad idea to have more of those things around, right? So, yeah, uh, this is not a particularly difficult thing to build. You don't really have to have great sewing skills to, to, to make one of these, uh, as I am most certainly a testament to that, because my sewing skills are not that great. Uh, but it's it's perfectly functional, it works well, it's decently compact, it's big enough to work, and yet small enough to carry, so, uh, yeah. So if you're interested in learning how to make one of these, let's go ahead and jump to the tutorial where I'll show you how I made this exact map case. Alright everyone, so to get started with this build, here is the list of everything you will need to complete this map case. Uh, one of the more interesting components for me, at least, was a bit of recycled uh, kitchen cutting board. So this is just something that I had around. I wanted a little piece of plastic sandwiched in between the, the layers of Cordura so that it can add a little bit of strength and add a little bit of rigidity to the whole thing so that it uh, doesn't flop around so much. This isn't really necessary. You can do it without it, but I just had this uh, leftover kitchen board um, that's kind of seen a lot of use in my camping setup and I have had no use for it anymore so I just use that, right? You can use whatever kind of plastic you have on hand. Uh, cutting board works really well, but if you don't have that, that's okay. For the uh, front plastic portion, I'm going with a piece of Lexan plastic. Not the easiest stuff to work with when it comes to uh, cutting it if you don't have a dedicated uh, cutting tool, but uh, it really works really well when it comes to mapping and drawing and things like that, so that's what I used. Uh, and for the main body of the map case, I'm going with just standard uh, run-of-the-mill 500 denier uh, Cordura. So uh, this particular Cordura is in Ranger Green for anyone concerned. So the main body of this map case could not be simpler. All we're doing is cutting out squares of each of these materials, the Cordura, the VS-17 panel, and the cutting board, and sandwiching all them all together in whatever dimension we chose. Again, I chose 7x10. Depending on what kind of plastic you used, uh, like I mentioned, I used a piece of cutting board which was a little bit slippery, uh, a little bit difficult to sew. Uh, so what I did was was just sewed it on one side, uh, sewed the quarter on one side, got that done, and then came back again and sewed on the 
VS17 on the other side, just to make it a little bit easier for me to kind of hold everything together rather than sewing three uh, pieces of material together at once. But whatever you can do works just fine. So there we go. Uh, there's the main body uh, done, and now we can put the edge around it. So depending on what materials you have, again, I wanted to kind of stick with using as little materials as possible. Uh, for me, I just used a piece of Cordura. So I took that uh, Cordura fabric piece that I had and cut a very long uh, two inch piece of of uh, fabric out of that to go around the edge. What I'm doing here is sewing it into a tube and on the inside of the tube I'm going to thread a piece of paracord. This will help me turn it inside out later. Normally you can use a piece of wooden dowel or another like rod uh, to kind of turn this inside out uh, when we get it all sewed up but I didn't have one that was th uh, thin or long enough so I just used a piece of paracord and that worked out just just fine. So once you have your long tube of Cordura, uh, which is going to be basically our stand-in for grow grain, uh, what we're going to do is just tack that uh, piece of paracord to the end, uh, to, to, to one end, uh, and then pull on the paracord, which will turn uh, that piece of uh, webbing basically inside out. Very handy little trick. Might be a little difficult to start, but once you get it going, uh, you can get it kind of like to the halfway point, uh, it finishes up quite nicely. So again, you can use a wooden dowel rod or something else for this, but I just had the paracord on hand, so that's the way I did it. Now when it comes to attaching this to the actual body of the map case, uh, there's a couple of different ways to do it. You can just line that seam up with the, the edge of the map case and sew it down that way. That's perfectly fine, perfectly valid, you could do that if you want. I find that it tends to get a little, lo little bit loose and I wanted this thing to be a little bit more rigid around the edges. So what I did was I, I basically just flattened it out. I uh, put the seam over to one side, flattened it out, and uh, ironed it as, as flat as I could get it. That way I can then take that and treat it kind of like a piece of one inch webbing and fold it over the edge. This creates a thicker side on one side. Uh, in this in this case, I, the thicker side of the webbing was on the uh, side of the VS-17 so that I had a little bit of a recess. Uh, so creating a thicker border which allowed me to fit more maps on the inside. So once you've got it ironed flat and you start stitching it onto the edge, it's really not a hard thing to do. You just kind of follow it along all the way around the, the edge of the map case. When you get to the corners, there's a few things you can do. I myself, in this case, was just really lazy and just decided to kind of fold it and crunch it kind of into the direction that I wanted it to go. This is definitely not the best tactic for 90 degree corners, but it worked, so I kind of went with it and I didn't really feel like uh, cutting that very small piece of webbing to make it uh, a little bit more uh, flow, flow a little bit better. Once the border was stitched on, I cut off the excess and went around it a, a, a one more time just to make sure that uh, everything was nice and double stitched and as strong as it possibly could be. I wanted to make sure this border wasn't going to come off and the whole thing to, to kind of fall apart, right? So just went around it one more time. Stitching it again never hurts and it adds a little bit of rigidity as well. And there you go. The center part of the map case is done. So now we can move on to cutting the Lexan to fit and making sure that everything is nice and uh, the right size uh, for snapping together. Like I mentioned, leg sand is not the easiest thing to work with, but I used a Dremel tool and a small cutoff wheel to cut it uh, to the right size. I cut it exactly to the size of 7x10, exactly the same as the fabric, but since I was going to grind off a little bit extra just to kind of sand it down and smooth it down, it ended up being slightly smaller than 7x10, which is just fine. Once the Lexan is cut and all sized uh, just right and sanded down to make sure it's not very sharp, you can move on to your webbing pieces. And for me, I just kind of eyeball it to get it started and uh, to kind of figure out what kind of size I wanted. And then I ended up going with three inch uh, pieces of webbing that I folded over on one end to basically create uh, a one inch square of webbing, if that makes any sense, uh, for the press stud to kind of go into. Cutting all of these pieces of webbing, you're going to need six in total. Uh, I went with, again, three inch pieces, which I would fold over, uh, then to become a grand total of two inches. You can use whatever webbing you get your hands on. It doesn't really matter too much. Um, I don't even know the, the, the specs of the webbing. This is just some webbing that I had left over from a different project that kind of matched uh, the Ranger Green kind of theme I was going for here. So, so once we get our webbing pieces ready to go, we can now uh, iron them flat to create that nice little seam, that folded over part. Uh, that's where our press set is going to go. And uh, yeah, just make sure you don't end up melting the webbing, uh, but it's a pretty easy zip across the sewing machine to create uh, six of these little uh, press stud holder things. I'm not really sure what to call them. 
Once you have your webbing pieces ready to go, you can decide where you want them to be placed on the main body. For me, I chose two inches from either end on the long 10 inch sides and one, uh, one in the middle on the seven inch sides for a grand total of six uh, webbing holders for the snap fasteners. I also tended to line up the seam of the thread along the border uh, as well, uh, just to make sure that all of the snap fasteners would, would end up more or less in the same place all the way around. Uh, and of course, marking everything to make sure that we keep everything uh, nice and right in the same spot. You don't want to get to the end and find out that none of these press studs are going to actually line up with uh, the Lexan plastic, right? So you want to make sure that everything is as straight as possible uh, and in the right spot. Once you stitch them on there, you can stitch all of them on, uh, and then we can start moving to putting the press studs in. Using a marker, I just went ahead and put a dot right in the center of that one inch square of webbing uh, so that we can have a good uh, target for uh, pushing this heated nail through. I just used a normal 10 penny nail and a blowtorch to allow me to punch through that webbing, uh, both layers of that webbing, very cleanly and efficiently uh, so that I wouldn't leave any kind of ragged edges behind. Then it's as simple as putting your snap fasteners in, uh, making sure that they all are facing the correct direction when they're going to be snapped into that sheet of Lexan. So pretty simple, just uh, using a standard, uh, pretty cheap uh, rivet package uh, for snap fasteners and uh, you know using the kit to kind of hammer them in place is pretty simple. So there you go. Uh, now we've got the main body done with the press stud snap fasteners in. Now we can start marking where they're going to go on the Lexan plastic. Now there's a few different ways of doing this. I again chose kind of the more lazy way and just simply put the Lexan plastic down where I wanted them to go. And uh, it's hard to see on the camera here, but I'm looking straight down at that snap fastener and kind of putting crosshairs right there, right in the middle of the snap fastener. Not necessarily the webbing, uh, but I'm creating a, a really good target for me to drill through to make absolutely certain that the snap fastener is in the right spot uh, when we go to attach it to the Lexan because once that snap fastener is attached to that Lexan plastic it's not moving any and you can't move it over a millimeter if you've messed up so just trying to be very careful and making sure that this all goes together correctly is important. Again, doing this for all six sides, we can now snap in the other side of the snap fastener to the Lexan plastic, making sure that everything fits together quite nicely. And once you've finished putting all of your snap fasteners together in the right spot, there you go, a functional map case. Uh, if you wish, you can stop here and this will work just fine. As you can see, slide your map in, close it, uh, close it pretty tightly and everything is nice and uh, organized and you have a pretty good viewing area. For me, I tend to want to add in a little bit of extra things. As we know, land nav is not just about maps, you need other things as well. Measuring devices, uh, protractors, sometimes little bits of paracord to help you measure things. Uh, and I, I tend to want to have my compass again with my map as well. Of course, when I'm out doing land nav, my compass is physically tied to my person and not uh, loosely in a map case like this, but when I'm just kind of, you know, storing my gear and things like that, I want to make sure that everything is kind of all together, uh, everything that I need to navigate in one spot. So what I wanted to do was add some pouches to the back. So the first pocket that I wanted to put on the back was a simple pen slot for a few uh, writing implements, uh, Sharpie markers, uh, dry erase markers if need be, uh, mechanical pencils, things like that. So I took a piece of scrap cordura and just hemmed it along two sides, making sure that it's very, very straight. Uh, I didn't even measure the end because I'm going to cut off uh, the end here in just a second. Uh, but this is going to be our pin pocket. So uh, for me, I kind of wanted to copy the same design that I had earlier. So what I did was uh, just sewed it to the very, very edge. I wanted to make sure to take advantage of all of the space uh, that I possibly could on the back of this map case. So there we go, stitching it in, and now we have the basis for our pin pockets. So of course, leaving a little bit of slack uh, to, to make sure there's room for the pin, I went ahead and stitched in the first pin sleeve, and then I repeated this a few times. I think I ended up adding five pin pockets uh, just because I had the extra space and that's kind of what I wanted to work with. Uh, some of them I made a little bit larger to fit things like Kim lights and uh, some of the electronic uh, krill lights if, if need be. Uh, one or two of them I left pretty thin to fit things like pencils and smaller, smaller markers. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Once I had all of the pin pockets in, I went ahead and zipped it across the bottom to close everything off. It doesn't look very nice, but hey, it works and it's functional. 
For the main pocket on the back, I just wanted to make sure that it was in fact large enough to hold a standard size protractor and maybe a couple of quick reference cards here and there. So I ended up cutting a square of fabric just to kind of fit that. Measurements don't really matter so much. Really, you're going to have to work with whatever space you have. I, I tended to maximize the space as much as I could, uh, and I think I ended up making this pocket 5x5. Five uh, but again, measurements didn't really matter so much for me at this stage because I was trying to make everything fit uh, as well as I could. So again, I hemmed all of the edges except for one edge, which I left uh, unhemmed because I was again going to do the same trick that I did with the pin pocket and just uh, sew it and uh, sew it upside down and then fold it over. So that's exactly what I did. Now it's at this stage that I should mention that I decided that I wanted to change the design as I was making it and kind of copy the original design that I had made because I decided that I really did want that compass pocket. I had originally just wanted the protractor pocket just to keep things low profile but I ended up putting in the compass pocket again so again put a smaller square of fabric right on top of that. This would have been easier to do before I had stitched it to the main map case but it worked out just fine. I was able to kind of sew this uh, the, the second pocket directly on top of it before I had gone too far and uh, changed my design. This is a thing with homemade products, you tend to change your design as you're, as you're building it. So once I had my two pockets ready to roll, I went ahead and stitched them down nice and tightly to the main map case body. And uh, I went around the edge a couple of times again just for that extra, extra rigidity and that extra support because I knew these pockets were going to get used quite a lot. So there you go, there are the pockets on the outside, there's the compass pocket and the place for a little light maybe, and your spot for your protractor. And now for the pocket flap. I ended up just taking yet another scrap of Cordura from uh, cutting earlier and just kind of made a nice little flap for, uh, for that pocket to uh, be snapped closed. Sewing the pocket flap to the main map case body, we can see how this is all coming together quite nicely. Really all that's left is to add in the snap fasteners for the main pockets. Now depending on how your pockets look, you might want to do things a little bit differently, but again I just used uh, a, again another nail uh, heated up with a blowtorch in order to, to, to punch some very nice clean and uh, uh, un non raveling holes uh, for the uh, snap fasteners, right? So, on the flap side of things, I went ahead and just kind of eyeballed it very nicely. But when it comes to the other side for this particular pocket, I wanted everything to be nice and snug, and I didn't want to have to pull out snap fasteners later. So, what I did was I filled all of the pockets up with what was going to, you know, be contained in them normally so that I can then mark it and put the snap fasteners in the right spot. There's nothing more annoying to realize that you've put a snap fastener just two millimeters uh, too short or too long and it just it looks bad and it, it doesn't really uh, it, it's not as effective as it could be so once I had had them in the right spot I pushed in the snap fasteners uh, to, to both sides and we're pretty much done and we are done. All we have to do is assemble everything and we're good to go. Uh, as you can see, this is not necessarily a beginner project, but even if you have very poor sewing skills like me, you can still do something like this. It's nothing it is particularly difficult. It just takes a bit of time if you're not really used to sewing too much. So again, this is a really handy thing to make. If you tend to like uh, having a, a solid map board to write on and you don't want to worry about uh, smudging too much, and if you like using Sharpies, which are more uh, permanent on Lexan, but it comes right off with alcohol, uh, that kind of thing, or, or any kind of uh, wax, grease pencil, map marker, that works out really well with this kind of setup. So, uh, And if you like making your own custom maps like, like I do, this works out all the better. So if you want to learn how to make your own custom maps, uh, we've made a tutorial on how to do that, and we might be re visiting that again in the future. So there we go, another quick project under our belts, and we can move on to the next one. Thanks again for watching, everyone. Thank you for all of your support, especially those of you who support us on Patreon and Utreon, and we will see you next time. And as always, fight in the shade.